greetings i have namaste and greetings i harsha kwari sochor at mp impact and policy research institute prabhav evam niti anusandhan sansthan nai delhi extend my warmest welcome to you all to mp web policy learning today we are gathered here for day 2 of feminist foreign policy in the asia pacific region an online international workshop program a two day immersive online discussion workshop this program is organized by mp center for international relations and strategic studies cirss impre impact and policy research institute new delhi before we dwell into the program let's take a moment of reflection on why feminist foreign policy is not just relevant but also crucial in today's world particularly in the diverse and dynamic landscape impact and policy research institute in new delhi continuing continuing with its dynamism is proud to organize a two day online workshop program according to the international center for research on women feminist foreign policy is the policy of state that defines its interactions with other states and movements in a manner that prioritizes gender equality and enshrines human rights of women and other historically marginalized groups allocates significant resources to achieve that vision and seeks through its implementation to disrupt patriarchal and male dominated power structures across all of its levels of influence aid trade defense and diplomacy informed by the voices of feminists activists groups and movements it recognizes that the gender sensitive policies contribute to more sustainable peace and security addressing issues such conflict prevention and post conflict reconstruction in post colonial context there's an urgent need to strengthen the spirit of networking and learning from each other's best practices and respect for diversity plurality and inclusivity that have been in the hallmark for south asian southeast asian East Asian, Central Asian countries, and Fiji Islands. The aim of the online workshop of feminist foreign policy, Asia Pacific region, is to for- foster a deeper understanding of feminist foreign policy principles, their relevance, and their potential impact on shaping international relations in the Asia Pacific region. We have gathered a distinguished panel of experts who will share their insights, experience on this crucial topic. The chair of the program is Vibhuti, Pat- Professor Vibhuti Patel, visiting distinguished professor at MIT. The distinguished experts include Ms. Farida Akhtar, Dr. Lavanya, Dr. Preeti Daruka, Ms. Irina Santiago, Dr. Vahida Nenar. The conveners of this session are Dr. Sini Mehta, CEO and editorial director at empty and dr arjun kumar director at empty i welcome you all to this enlightening deliberation and thank you for putting in your time energy and efforts for truly understanding the vital role and complex intricacies of feminism and foreign policies before we start today's session i would like to announce the housekeeping rules it is imperative that you join the meeting on time there will be a q and a session after each presentation share your questions in the q and a box and not in the chat box the questions must not be posted as an anonymous attendee ensure your questions are precise refrain from general com- comments in the question and answers to save time the theme for today is feminist foreign policy in the asia pacific region with regards to transnational solidarity before starting i would request professor vibhuti ma'am for her opening chair remarks to set the context for the session good afternoon friends first of all i would like to express my heartfelt thanks to dr arjun kumar dr simi mehta dr satyam tripathi shrimati harsha kavatra for uh, of the impre team to put this workshop together as per the public demand i welcome our guru ms irene santiago dr atika noor alami and dr vaidya nainath to this online international workshop on feminist foreign policy in asia and pacific region yesterday's theme was climate change and we had a very interesting discussion on the the terminology of feminist foreign policy why so many countries are using the term gender equality what have been the whole history and the trajectory of 
climate change discourses. And today uh, we are going to have a similar deliberation on the peace initiative. The major objectives of declaration of International Women's Year in 1975 and International Women's Decade in, from 1975 to 85 were equality, development, and peace. Women's movement also raised a slogan, personal is political, and conveyed in that peace in the family, peace in the community, peace in the nation state, within the nation state, and peace between the countries uh, and the world peace were all equally important. In the transnational feminist solidarity, combating gender-based violence and strengthening efforts of peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peace building were proactively integrated, especially after 1993, uh, the Vienna Convention of UNHRC, where it was decided that the, we have such a strong uh, legacy and extremely devastating legacy of more than 5,000 years of patriarchal control over women's sexuality, fertility, and labor, that we need a campaign, 15 days of campaign from 25th November to 10th of December, every year focusing on gender-based violence, violence and peace initiative. So what we see that crystallization of feminist foreign policy, for which today's all three panelists have played a very important role, Resolution 1325 began a series of conversations that enabled us to interrogate the ethnocentric, anthropocentric, and androcentric notions of security. It is significant as it is a bottom-up resolution. It emerged from the experiences of women's activism at the grassroots level because of lobbyism by NGOs and United Nations Development Fund for Women, UNIFAM. There were 10 other resolutions that together covered a whole gamut of concerns and, uh, uh, and made women's peace and security a global agenda with the conviction that women's inclusion will improve chances of attaining uh, viable and sustainable peace. There must be zero tolerance for all forms of gender violence and together they refer to global codification of principles that underlie dignity, rights and bodily integrity of women. We are fortunate to have today's experts who have a first-hand experience of the peace negotiations, Ms. Irene Santiago, Atika Noor Alami, and Dr. Vaida Naina, who have been at the forefront of peace negotiations with the multilateral, global, and regional agencies. Now, I request the uh, IMPRI team to take over and begin the discussion. Hello, I request Dr. Irene Santiago to yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Yes, we, oh, we can we invite our speaker. Yeah. Yes. We have a three, three panelists today. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you to IMPRI for this invitation to speak on this very important topic, uh, feminist foreign policy in the Asia Pacific region. My warm greetings to all of you who are attending this workshop online and special greetings to my dear friend, Professor Vibhuti Patil, who extended this invitation to me on behalf of IMPRI. First, full disclosure. I have never been a diplomat <laughs> and never will be. Uh, you will soon realize why. Neither am I a researcher. So the point of view I take is one of who has been an organizer of mayhem and movements. Um, so <clears throat> in other words, I have been involved in trying to bring about societal change from local, national, Asia Pacific and global levels to bring about a peaceful and just society where everyone can lead long, happy lives. As an organizer who is also a feminist, I have learned a few lessons. I would like to share these lessons with you as a way of reflecting on what we can do moving forward. Allow me to name three lessons. Lesson number one, if you can't name it, you can't have it. You all remember the many hours we spent on consciousness raising in the early days of the feminist movement. 
many scripts in our heads and our hearts that made us live and behave the way we did in a patriarchal world. Then somebody coined personal is political. What a powerful three words these were. Yes, we moved our personal issues to the public realm where they were discussed in policies and rules and allocation of resources. Yes, the public arena, all areas of decision-making outside of the private sphere where our issues were previously hidden. Personal is political, was pure genius. Lesson number two, the approach add women and stir doesn't work. It doesn't work big time. We, we demanded more representation, more participation, but what happened? More women in the labor market, but where in the labor market? We got more, but they were in the bottom of the pile. More women in politics, but what kind of politics? Collateral question, what kind of women? Lesson number three, everything substantial is about power. Who will, how, why, for what purpose? After Beijing, or the Fourth World Conference on Women in China, gender mainstreaming became the main approach to integrating gender into everything. I must admit, we dropped the ball here. What was essentially about power became substantially a technical issue of data segregation and budget allocations, etc. I will talk about power again later in this short speech. I will stop at these three lessons and see where we can move forward in advocating for a feminist foreign. As it stands, the countries that have instituted a feminist foreign policy have focused on what they call the four R's. Rights, representation, resources, and reality, or context. You and I must admit that these four are all political issues. Rights, resources, representation, and reality, I repeat, are political issues. Some countries, to their credit, have been working on pushing for the four R's in trade, defense, diplomacy, and development. This is certainly laudable, but how far can this kind of foreign policy approach tackle oppression and exploitation of the powerless when these operate entirely the existing economic, political, and social world order? It sounds to me like the women, add the women and stir lesson we previously debunked. In other words, there is a need to examine the structural underpinnings of the four R's, especially considering the crisis of major proportions our world is facing, the climate change crisis, the climate crisis, the economic crisis, the health crisis. They all are transnational in scope, and some people are more vulnerable and impacted than others because they hold little or no power. Are our concerns able to deal with this transnational crisis? Are our concepts, are our concepts able to deal with this transnational crisis in a way, meaning a change in relationships? To what our movement did in the early days, when we examine the concepts or the mindsets 
or the paradigms that were the straight jack from which we needed to free ourselves. If we are to face the transnational crisis we are facing, one concept we could examine is the whole notion of, quote, sovereignty. Sovereign 1648, with the peace of Westphalia that ended the 30 years war in Europe. The Treaty of Westphalia established the nation states, each one, its state, being sovereign within its own boundaries. It helped countries function independently of each other. The practice of diplomacy was initiated as negotiations of peace treaties became the mode of ending any disputes. However, some the same concept of sovereignty has been invoked by nation states to keep people out of their borders, to keep large standing armies, and to go to war. As we discussed, discuss feminist foreign policy, is there a way of reformulating sovereignty as an approach to solving our major crisis in a transnational way? or formulate a totally new concept, just as we did with personal is political. Just adding women won't redeem the world. Indeed, some writers have said that that's a heavy burden to be laid on women. There's a need to reconceptualize feminism in light of this point in our history and the daunting challenges facing humanity, and not just those in Asia and the Pacific. As we reconceptualize sovereignty, let's also analyze how other mindsets make it ever so easy to divide people and foment hatred and anger for the other, as we can see in many parts of the world today. Last week, I spoke before the Indian Association for Women's Studies and share this short analysis, which I also want to share with you today. What is the most devastating, devastating word in the English language? It is a two letter word. That's all, two letters. But because of those two letters, the suffered genocide, war, and the most brutal atrocities. For example, 6 million Jews died because of a two letter word. That two letter word is or. Me or you, us or them, my country or your country, my religion or your religion. For some reason, we are wired to think that some people have to be superior, others inferior. Some strong, some weak, some smart, others stupid. Some winners, others losers, some saved, and others consigned to eternal fire. And what is the antidote to the devastating or? It's a three letter word. I call it the awesome end, A N. D. My country and your country, my religion and your religion. We are all superior, strong, smart, winners, saved. Remember John Lennon's song? Imagine, imagine there's no country, no religion too no hell below us, above us on the sky. Yes, the power of our connectors, the idea that nobody and nothing stands alone and we can live in peace with each other and with nature. As women, we have these capacities. When I sit down to plan any strategy for change that I will initiate, I look at three barriers, the conceptual barriers, the technical barriers, 
and the political barriers. The conceptual barriers must break down not only patriarchy, but all the other evil systems. We have to remember that gender equality is organically integrated in economic, political, and social equality. Concepts like the devastating or and the awesome end must penetrate our plans. Second, the technical barriers can be broken down by building our capacity with effectiveness and efficiency, knowledge and skills. And last, the political barriers are broken down not only by solidarity, but also by using power differently, transformatively. How? Not just by getting to the leader circle, but more fundamentally, by redefining power as the potency to act for what is good. It is changing the goal of power to act for what is good. Then it is transformative. More than anything, feminist foreign policy must put the four R's within this solid framework. Yes, it is, in, it is within our reach to build a just and equal world that benefits everyone because no one stands alone. We are all connected. My hope is that that will be what feminist foreign policy will be. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'm sorry for the uh, glitch. I'd like to reintroduce ma'am again. Um, Irene Miranda Santiago has enjoyed an exceptional career in peace and development, spanning over 40 years in the Philippines, as well as internationally. She has been a peace negotiator, peace agreement implemented, teacher and trainer, organizer, and a thought leader. Ms. Santiago has distinction of being the only woman in the world today who has both a member hello yes irene very inspiring talk yeah uh, harsha are you there yeah. yes ma'am i'm continuing hello Ma'am, I hope I'm visible. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you are visible. Yes. Okay. Miss Santiago has the distinction of being the only woman in the world today who has both a member of peace negotiating panel and chair of body implementing a major peace agreement. She was a member of the Philippines government peace panel negotiating with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front from 2001 to 4 and in 2016 was the first chair of the panel implementing the Comprehensive Banks Maro Peace Agreement. Ms. Santiago is well known internationally as head of secretary of Historical NGO Forum on Women in China in 1995. As a parallel event to the UN Fourth World Conference on Women, the Beijing Conference, the NGO Forum was attended by 30,000 participants. Prior to that, Ms. Santiago was the chief of Asia Pacific Section of the United Nations Development Fund for Women, UNIFEP, in New York. In that position, Ms. Santiago was one of the early pioneers of mainstreaming gender in peace and development. As an NGO leader, she's co-founded the Mindiago Commission on Women, Christian and Indigenous Women Leaders. She also founded the Mothers for Peace Movement and Women's Peace Tables Worldwide in advance, the significant role of women in women peace and security. Currently, she's the senior advisor on peace building at Local Government Academy of the Department of Interior and Local Government, DILG, tasked with building local capacities for peace in areas suffering from long-term violent conflict. She has designed and implemented a peace process called Peace 911 that successfully stopped a 40-year violent conflict in Pantiago district in Davao City within nine months of operations by building local peace capacities. 
Miss Santiago was also nominated for the Nobel Prize in 2005 as one of the 1,000 outstanding women peacemakers and peace builders in world. In 2020, she was named one of the top 10 women in world for inaugural Women Building Peace Award of United States Institute of Peace, USIP, in Washington, D.C. She was also selected for the 2013 NPeace Award as a role model for peace from Philippines, an award that recognizes the leadership role of women and peace advocates from six conflict affected, affected countries in Asia Pacific. Ms. Santiago holds a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University in New York, where she was a Fulbright Smith Munden scholar. She graduated with a liberal arts degree from the Philippine Women's College of Davao, Sama Cum Laude. Thank you, ma'am, and we welcome you. Yeah. Thank you, Irene, for such an inspiring talk. You have always been, you have made, you made us all optimistic and all of us are eternally op optimistic. In fact, later on after the panel, all panel speakers speak, we would also like you to share some of the very emulating examples and your personal uh, involvement in the episodes. I think both you and Vaida can do because Vaida has also been in several uh, such negotiations. I think that would be a very educative for all of us because many of the participants would like to be active in the public life. They are part of the social movements and women's movement, but how to negotiate with those who are at the apex bodies of power structure. I think we would like to learn from you. So now we can, I think, move to Dr. Atika Noor Alami. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, good evening from Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, it is such an honor for me to be part of this uh, important panel on feminist foreign policy in the Asia Pacific for transnational solidarity for peace. Thank you so much, Impri, and particularly Prof. Vibhuti Patel for your very kind invitation. So I can join this panel and learn from uh, other, I think, uh, incredible uh, panelists. And thank you also other respective panelists uh, that have shared their insights. And thank you also the audience for your attendance. I think I really, uh, I've been struck with uh, Ms. Irene Santiago's speech. It's really uh, a very important and inspiring speech. I really enjoy uh, her speech and uh, really become a reflection on uh, and how actually the Women, Peace and Security agenda have been uh, going on so far. And maybe uh, my presentation will relate to some of the uh, uh, Ms. Santiago's uh, speech. Uh, actually, I want to also uh, want to make a disclaimer also that actually I'm uh, basically I'm a researcher. Uh, so probably, I mean, uh, the approach that uh, that I will use and also some of, uh, I mean, the contents of my presentation really look at some of the uh, maybe some of theoretical and also uh, the the practical, uh, I mean, uh, the practical lessons for, for the gender uh, uh, and security, peace and security uh, uh, agenda. Uh, currently, uh, actually, my uh, research team at the Research Center for Politics, National Research and Innovation Agency Indonesia uh, is conducting a research on gender in Indonesian foreign policy. So we focus on two aspects, actually, the institutional uh, aspect of foreign policy by uh, looking at the gender mainstreaming strategy at the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. And the second aspect is at the foreign policy level by examining some uh, gender uh, responsive foreign policies of Indonesian government. As you know that actually Indonesia is having its uh, first uh, female foreign uh, minister that really uh, to some extent mark a significant milestone in foreign services that is perceived as a male dominated area. I can say that uh, to some extent a female foreign minister contributes in advancing uh, women's rights and gender equality issues, including in peace and security. And our foreign minister, um, uh, Ms. Ratno Marsudi, also have shown uh, considerable attention, not only on the role of women in foreign policy, including a woman's involvement as peacekeepers, but also bringing up a woman's issue in our relation with uh, some countries, such as uh, Afghanistan. Therefore, I think uh, that our discussion today on women in peace and security, including the role of uh, transnational solidarity is highly relevant in the case of Indonesia uh, in particular and other Southeast Asian countries and of course uh, the Philippines. 
uh, next slide please okay uh, okay to, to discuss uh, transnational solidarity for peace in Southeast Asia my presentation will consist of four main section first actually uh, I will explore just a brief how gendering uh, peace and security has become global attention and why it is significant to apply gender lens uh, in peace and security affairs and then the second section uh, will focus on women in peace and security agenda in Southeast Asian countries uh, at the national and regional level, including ASEAN. And in the third section, I will discuss uh, how uh, transnational solidarity play roles in advancing women in peace and security agenda in the region. And finally, in the last section, I will also explore the remaining challenges in the implementation of women and peace security agenda but also uh, how to move forward uh, uh, in advancing women in peace and security agenda for you know sustainable development in the region. So basically, uh, my focus will be uh, in the context of Southeast Asia. I yeah, hope it will, uh, I mean, uh, give you uh, ideas, uh, new ideas about what happens in Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I think in today's world, uh, uh, we already know that we often see how uh, conflicts in and insecurity still persist. And in response to the situation, I think it's crucial to recognize the importance of a gender uh, inclusive approach to peace building and security. It is because, as we know, that conflict, security, and peace are not gender neutral because women and men experience conflict differently. Women and children tend to be fixed. So uh, uh, their experiences uh, made women aware that they are not only victims, but also survivors. They're also agents of change, such as peace builders, peacekeepers, and participating in peace regulation. And even women, uh, uh, even women uh, active uh, participation in war began by helping uh, behind the front lines. They still in the you know uh, in the canteen keepers, nurse, and maybe comforters. However, uh, when the peace arrive, women contributors are forgotten. I think that's the main uh, issue here. And despite uh, increased international attention to the issue of gender, changes in uh, peace building and security have not been implemented in a meaningful way and transformative way. Uh, it can be seen in the lack of uh, engagement uh, with experiences and needs of women this uh, issue reflects a deep-rooted problem in how we address peace and security. Uh, for, fortunately, I think this area has gained attention, uh, significant attention actually, through the adoption of gender mainstreaming in United Nations peace building practice. Although, you know, I mean, uh, gender mainstreaming actually have been criticized also, as, uh, uh, as Ms. Santiago also mentioned. Uh, the commitment to incorporating uh, women, peace, and security agenda into peace and security activities has been made through the adoption of UN Security Council 1325 in the year of uh, 2000. And I think the UN SCR uh, 1325 stressed the importance of involving women in all peacekeeping and peace building measures and incorporating a gender perspective into peacekeeping operation. Uh, as we know that the four pillars of the resolution are participation, prevention, protection, and relief and recovery. And this uh, resolution uh, actually mark a, a significant milestone in how we recognize and address the disproportionate impact of war on women. And to implement this agenda, uh, uh, UN United Nations member states were encouraged to develop national action plans on women, peace, and security. Uh, and we will discuss how actually women, peace, and security agenda has been implemented in Southeast Asia, including uh, at the national and regional levels. Next slide, please. OK, in this section, uh, uh, I will talk about, I mean, the experiences of uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries. Uh, as we know that in Southeast Asia, Women and uh, woman peace and security is particularly relevant due to the region's history of conflicts and uh, ongoing security challenges. We know that conflict and violence are issues that affect many countries in Indonesia, uh, including in us 
Asia, including Indonesia, uh, in the form, you know, subnational conflicts, intercommunal conflict, intrastate conflict. Uh, and recently, we can see, for example, uh, how the largest uh, refugee uh, camp in the world, as in the Bangladesh, because of the fastest growing refugee exodus from the Rakhine state uh, of Myanmar due to violence and discrimination, and also other Southeast Asian countries such as India, such as Indonesia, sorry, the Philippines, Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos also face a significant problems such as land and natural resource conflict, and also many communities experience violent crimes. And I think although Southeast Asian uh, region is prone to conflict and surely, surely bring impacts on women, up to now, I can say that only uh, uh, three countries, uh, including Timor-Leste, uh, that have a national action plan on women and peace security. These countries are Philippines, uh, Indonesia, and Timor-Leste, uh, while other uh, ASEAN countries actually uh, have enacted many policies to boost uh, progress on women, peace, and security. For example, uh, a gender action plan for law enforcement uh, was drafted in Cambodia. Uh, and then Myanmar also enacted a national strategic plan for the advancement of women. And also uh, the law on gender equality passed uh, in uh, Vietnam. And national the national strategy on gender equality in Vietnam also was adopted in 2010. Uh, and I think in terms of the uh, uh, deployment of female uh, peacekeeper, I think we can see in the graph that until 2019, there was actually an upward trend uh, in the number of total deployed uniform female personnel uh, from some uh, contributing countries in South Asia. And the increasing number uh, of uh, female uh, peacekeepers is largely the result of uh, Indonesia, uh, Cambodia, and uh, uh, Malaysia. Next slide, please. And I want to look at uh, particularly in the case of Indonesia. I think in the case of Indonesia, uh, in implementing the UN, uh, uh, UN Security Council 1325, Indonesia pursue uh, two level. First, at the domestic level, Indonesia has conducted localization of UNSCR 1325, Indonesia has uh, end of war to localize a uh, women, peace, and security agenda into a national uh, action plan. In 2014, the first uh, national action plan for the protection and empowerment of women and children during social conflict was launched. Uh, it included three pillars, prevention, mitigation, and empowerment, uh, empowerment uh, mitigation and empowerment, and participation of women and children. And the second uh, national action plan on uh, women peace security, uh, 2020 and 2025, was adopted in July 2021 after the national uh, consultation on reviewing the national action plan on women peace and security in Indonesia. And the second national action plan actually incorporates emerging and non-traditional security issues uh, that become the priorities of Indonesia, including uh, violent uh, extremism, intolerance, uh, radicalization, and, and even uh, uh, hate speech uh, online. Uh, besides the, uh, at the domestic level, the commitment to peace, to women, peace, and security also apparent in the foreign policy level by putting it as a, one of the priorities of Indonesian foreign policy. In Indonesia, I think, uh, Indonesia, I think uh, within ASEAN uh, is the top troop contributors to UN peacekeeping mission. Uh, Indonesia uh, deploys uh, close to 3,000 uniform personnel, but only 5% uh, are women. And at least until since 1999, Indonesian uh, have participated uh, in US peacekeeping mission by sending uh, 500 <laughs> 70 women and also until 2020 Indonesia also uh, deploy uh, about one, 158 uh, women to UN peacekeeping mission uh, and also until uh, uh, September 2021 Indonesia has mobilized 
179 uh, uh, women soldiers. And the contribution of Indonesian female peacekeeper in the United Nations uh, peacekeeping operation actually is enforced by the adoption of the internal our regulation on foreign affairs ministry of the Republic of Indonesia uh, on the roadmap vision of 4,000 uh, personnel uh, uh, between 2015 and 2019 to increase the female peacekeepers uh, at the end of 2019. And also, I think one of the achievements actually under the presidency of Indonesia in 2020, the UN Security Council passed resolution uh, uh, 2538 on women and peacekeeping. It is actually the first resolution on peacekeeping uh, devoted to full uh, to women. And uh, the resolution uh, actually calls UPON member states and the UN to strengthen their collective efforts to promote uniform and civilian women's full, effective, and meaningful uh, engagement in peacekeeping operation at all levels and all positions. Next slide, please. And at the regional level, I think I have to acknowledge also uh, ASEAN. Uh, I think the, the first important milestone is the joint statement on women, peace, and security in ASEAN adopted at the uh, 31st ASEAN Summit in Manila uh, in November 20, uh, 2017. The statement recognized the, that peace and security are essential to the achievement of sustainable development. And following up the joint statement, ASEAN established the ASEAN Women for Peace Registry as a mean to text stock of uh, its women expert in peace process and in uh, and during the even during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, ASEAN foreign minister also uh, attempted to uh, dialogue on strengthening women's role for sustainable peace and security it includes also uh, women peace and security agenda uh, and integrated uh, into the wider uh, ASEAN uh, uh, economic uh, integration efforts and other uh, ASEAN community. Uh, and I think with the support of the US Agency for International Development and UN Women, ASEAN launched the ASEAN Regional Study on Women, Peace and Security in uh, 2021. And we should acknowledge also that this regional initiative have demonstrated how women, peace and security agenda is advancing in ASEAN. But we can discuss actually uh, I mean, the, the, the implementation aspect of these uh, uh, initiatives. Next slide, please. Okay, now I think uh, I will uh, 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 continue to uh, the transnational solidarity of women in peace and security. In general, I think according to the regional study on women peace security in ASEAN, there are three points of engagement between ASEAN and civil society organization. The first is through IHR, which is mandated in IHR uh, uh, terms of reference uh, to engage uh, uh, civil society in dialogue and consultation. The second engagement is through ASEAN Commission on the Promotion and Protection of Women and Children. It is mentioned also in its terms of reference to uh, to have you know like a collaborative and consultative approach with civil society. And another point of engagement uh, between ASEAN and civil society organization is through ASEAN Committee on Migrant Workers, particularly through ASEAN Forum on Migrant Labors. Then how actually transnational advocacy has been made on women peace security. Uh, it should be acknowledged that, uh, uh, that uh, women in peace and security agenda is uh, marked out by the presence of multiple stakeholders, including numerous uh, non-state actors such as NGO network during the advocacy of the UN uh, uh, NCR 1325 that was adopted in the year of uh, 2000. Therefore, I think the first, uh, I mean, uh, kind of uh, uh, contribution of transnational advocacy is how civil society has engaged in the process of norm emergence from the outset. Is it? Uh, I, I took it from the study of True and Weiner, 2019. Uh, and also, second, secondly, civil society also participate in developing action policies and implementation mechanism to further uh, uh, women peace security agenda. For example, through the Asian Women Peace Builder Networks as a platform for women in civil society organization uh, around the region. And the third, I think the third kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, advocacy, civil society organization also play roles in the prevention aspect. In the case of Indonesia, 
civil society organization uh, through the uh, contribute in the establishment of working group uh, in 10 uh, conflict sensitive province. So civil society organization uh, initiate uh, a women led community based uh, programs. You know, some, some of the organizations such as Wahid Foundation also have uh, have a training and uh, a mentoring program for women to be facilitators of a dialogue to combat intolerance and uh, extremism. And in Myanmar, for example, uh, some civil society organization also promote more participatory and inclusive conflicts. In the Philippines, I know that uh, advocacy networks work together in designing and implementing local action plans. Uh, Fourth, I think uh, civil society also play roles in the protection aspect. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the Myanmar government has worked with civil society in uh, to draft the protection and prevention of violence against women. And another, I think, kind of engagement or contribution of a uh, transnational advocacy network is through uh, a relief and recovery process. For example, the Vietnam government. Uh, encourage cooperation with a uh, women's organization in post-conflict uh, reconciliation. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, despite all these, you know, uh, achievements and initiative, I think we have to also acknowledge the persistent, uh, I mean, and the remaining challenges to, uh, to women peace and security agenda and also the, uh, the transnational uh, advocacy. The first, uh, I think, challenges is about the the low uh, the level of women participation. First, remains low. Uh, it is because you know the low supply in the recruitment process, and uh, there is a problem of the concept of side streaming. Uh, uh, bringing up by newbie and C bag, it means that sidelining women and relegating them to a specialized space in international peace and security while attempting gender mainstreaming. The second, I think, challenges about uh, which is common, I think, in many uh, ASEAN countries, is about social cultural constraints. As we know, that security sector is still perceived as a masculine, uh, you know, domain with military culture and gender stereotype, and the military area is considered a more, uh, is not is not considered as an appropriate space for women. It then position women as a subordinate inside the peacekeeping mission. Uh, I think the, the 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 other challenges, which is important also in terms of institutional design in ASEAN, particularly related to the ASEAN way, which emphasize uh, consensus building and non-interference that can be a barrier to feminist uh, activism and the promotion of women's rights. We can discuss later. And despite all the barriers, I think I believe that transnational advocacy networks for the women, peace, and security agenda need to move forward at least in two directions. First, uh, by involving civil society in the formal uh, uh, negotiation process. With, with, uh, it, it means that um, create more space for civil society engagement. And I think women, uh, women need to engage also uh, uh, I mean, their, sorry, their involvement also important to create a more uh, comprehensive uh, and inclusive approach to uh, peace building. And the second, I think, uh, strategy or uh, prospect is to have uh, engagement with uh, men to support women's empowerment because, you know, that mainstreaming women, peace and security agenda cannot be done in isolation. Uh, uh, women, we also need to uh, encourage male leaders to be the advocates for gender inclusion in peace and security affairs in order to challenge the existing uh, structural, uh, uh, I mean, system. And I can say that patriarchal structures and gender bias are still deeply ingrained in our society. This uh, might especially hold true for diplomacy and security affairs that have been predominantly understood as male domains. Nevertheless, with the UN resolution uh, 1325 on women, peace, and security, uh, adopted more than uh, 20 years ago, and the discussion uh, uh, on women's meaningful participation has created transformative uh, impacts. Effects. I think I agree with uh, Ms. Santiago. I mean, terms by using uh, transformative uh, uh, effects. And if we consider actually feminist foreign policy as a political framework that promotes the overarching goals of gender equality, human rights, peace, and environment integrity, 
uh, it is basically a reflection of the larger worldwide efforts following the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325. Therefore, I think lastly, a feminist foreign policy should not be limited to boasting the number uh, of women in diplomatic services. Instead, the focus should be on moving away from a patriarchal system while establishing policies that prioritize women's interests and, uh, uh, and rights. Okay, I think, uh, next slide. I think that's all my uh, presentation. Thank you so much for your uh, kind attention. Feel free to uh, drop your comments and questions. Hopefully, I will be able to respond to uh, all the uh, questions and uh, uh, concerns. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I give you back to uh, Prof. Patel. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Atika Noor Alami, for giving such a comprehensive view of uh, Southeast Asian, East Asian, and South Asian countries and the status report of what is the level of uh, negotiations both at uh, involvement of CSOs and also those who are in the uh, military and army. But it uh, seems that in Asian countries, more or less, it is a masculine discourse and women have yet to play a very significant role, uh, especially the, the tempo of the 80s and 90s that we had because there was a robust women's movement and the kind of discourses which are taking place, I think they need to, we need to revive that culture of taking stand on political issues. It's a very important learning. And I uh, appreciate that you also agree with Irene that we need to uh, address the larger political and economic structures, no? the world order that is so exploitative and uh, very inequitous. So we need to, without addressing that issue, we can't have a, any kind of uh, redressal to women's problem. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I would like to introduce ma'am again. Um, Dr. Alami is head of research center for politics, Pandan Research Stan Innovasi National Brin, Jakarta, Indonesia. And thank you, ma'am, for that insightful session. Now I would like to introduce our next speaker, which is Dr. Wahida Nenor. She's an independent researcher, gender and human rights consultant. Thank you, ma'am, and over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to begin by appreciating the IMPRI team for putting together this uh, um, this very interesting panel on feminist foreign policy, um, a two-day panel. I would like to thank Impre and Professor Patel for having me here as a panelist. Um, I'm afraid I missed the session yesterday, but I'm looking forward to the discussion here today. I really would like to thank Irene Santiago for giving this um, contextualizing this in in you know in conceptual terms because uh, that's where uh, you know it's it's from the conceptual critiques of what is happening without in any way undermining the achievements that one can move ahead keep keep questioning and keep finding solutions and find ways to move forward i also thank dr atika for giving us uh, this um, you know the uh, landscape of how where women peace security agenda stands within the ASEAN ASA, Southeast Asian countries. I will uh, also talk about um, focus my talk on the South Asian region with regard to the issues of women peace and security. Uh, doing both a little bit of both, you know, putting together the status of where we are with regard to women, peace and security within the region. And at the same time, question and, uh, you know, uh, uh, bring the uh, critiques that have been there and how its relevance to advance this agenda uh, as we move forward. So that's what uh, we'll be talking about. And um, so feminist foreign policy, to begin with, there is no such thing in South Asia, as you know, we all know. Um, South Asian countries are uh, uh, a lot more in, in conservative, if I might, for lack of a better word, with regard to any kind of regional uh, mechanism with uh, putting forward gender issues 
or issues of uh, women, uh, peace and security uh, for common discussion or resolution of problems with regard to peace and security in the region. So there is no such thing existence. Just for example, just one of the uh, uh, platform, which is called the SARC Commission, um, there is no mention of gender, for example, in the last statement that was put forward. I think the last meeting was in 2014. Uh, that happened in Kathmandu. There is no uh, mention of the word gender. There is a small line about protection of uh, women and children and uh, and such like that, but there's no such issue at all raised that one can say moves forward in any way women, peace and security agenda. Of course, it is not to say that um, that is uh, that South Asia, you know, has is home to several conflicts and confrontation, both intrastate as well as interstate uh, uh, confrontations. We have longstanding border disputes in the region between India and China and India and Pakistan. There are all kinds of forced displacement of, you know, we were Rohingya Muslims leading to the largest refugee crisis in Bangladesh coming to. We have uh, the rise of the Taliban, the Taliban takeover again in August 2021 of Afghanistan, triggering a mass exodus of professionals, women, and you know, and all this causes enormity, enormous volatility and unpredictability in the region. And add to this the internal strife and conflicts within India, the long-standing ones that is there in Kashmir and the northeast region of, uh, of the country. Then we had long and protracted civil wars in Sri Lanka and you had the civil war in, in Nepal for the longest time. And these two countries, Sri Lanka and Nepal, continues to struggle with the aftermath and questions of you know, peace reconciliation and peace building and state nation building in, with the aftermath at the end of war. None of these questions that were prevalent during the war has in any way, any substantial way been resolved. They still are simmering uh, under the surface. And um, Sri Lanka is also dealing with unprecedented economic crisis. Similarly, in Pakistan is dealing with, you know, economic crisis as well as constitutional ones that, you know, emerge every now and then. So the, there is a range of threats in the region that talks uh, um, about that are, exposes real risks uh, of spilling into interstate kind of conflicts. And the links bit uh, of these longstanding conflicts uh, um, and insecurity and is, is well established with poverty and other kinds of uh, um, um, developmental related issue or backward or lack of uh, progress on development issues. So um, the progress towards peace and security cannot be made without tackling the root causes of, of conflicts like uh, your poverty, corruption, inequalities, discrimination, um, through application of rule of law, respect for human rights for all, um, arms control issues, improved governance. Addressing these issues could help mitigate the root causes of conflict. So these are uh, the realities of the region and you can see the uh, the need to uh, initiate a discussion on uh, peace and security regionally, but at the same time, you know, prioritizing women from the women's peace security framework and agenda, but none of them is happening at the formal level. So that is, uh, you know, to put out there in South Asia region. A, a feminist foreign policy, um, uh, feminist foreign policy is uh, as, uh, uh, I, Irene Santiago mentioned, you know, is basically integration of core feminist principles into, um, into various processes and systems of the state. Um, and, and this has to be done with an understanding of, um, uh, with an intersectional understanding of gender, with a uniform commitment to peace and nuanced, gender nuanced understanding of economic development and so forth through the tools of the four R's, if you will. Those are the means to attain a larger objective of feminist, policy, feminist foreign policy of overall gender equality, uh, you know, uh, in, in the region. 
Um, a feminist foreign policy could be in all kinds of, you know, instituted in all um, areas uh, of um, social, all, all areas of uh, state life, whether it's social, economic, uh, political, legal, and in a way that it goes beyond uh, symbolism and, and rhetoric. Um, and it could be on all kinds of issues. For example, if I looked at the issues that SARC deals with, all kinds of uh, issues, uh, uh, national interests, peace and security generally, without mentioning gender, human rights, equality, trade and economic cooperation, humanitarian emergencies, trans-border issues of uh, you know, movement of people between two countries, uh, trafficking of women, children, labors between countries, um, and, and health related, climate related. So all these issues are mentioned, for example, in the SARC agenda, but all of it without in any way acknowledging um, uh, or, you know, inclusion of gender. So formally, uh, you know, regionally as such, there isn't much uh, uh, um, acknowledgement of the need for a women peace agenda to be inculcated as, as a region. Nevertheless, given that there are these long-standing conflicts and all of that, the women peace security agenda, as you know, as, as uh, explained by Dr. Atika in her presentation, that remains the same. Um, with, uh, uh, with that, that uh, is um, and, uh, through the uh, UN Security Council Resolution of 1325 has been introduced because we do have conflict countries. And, um, and this agenda has been uh, introduced in places where uh, there are, um, um, where there are um, conflicts, uh, longstanding conflicts, or with whether it is, or they have a conflict recent past, or in countries that are uh, dependent on international aid. Um, so that's where the Women, Peace and Sick agenda enters the region, uh, most within the national framework. So um, the first breakthrough in women's peace agenda in the form of, nevertheless, just to give a little bit background of the UN Security Council 1325, which was a breakthrough moment with regard to women peace security agenda that feminists have been advocating for a long time. It nevertheless fell short of the feminist vision of uh, women peace security agenda uh, with regard to understanding of uh, the terminology of peace. When feminist and women's advocate uh, raised the issue of peace, the idea was more of an, one, an intersectional analysis of conflict. The idea was peace equals to demilitarization and anti-militarist policy politics of peace with active involvement of women at every stage of conflict resolution and sustainable uh, peace. So this vision, uh, UN as Security uh, 1325 uh, fell short, but it is nevertheless uh, ushered, uh, it, it is nevertheless a milestone moment and it ushered a discussion about engendering peace processes with the four pillars that um, Dr. Nutika just, um, uh, Adhika just mentioned. Um, and it is now a benchmark for uh, a sta of state commitment to peace and security around the world. And this uh, um, commitment is, test is, is tested, the implementing mechanism of 13 to 25 resolutions and uh, the subsequent resolutions were passed to follow up on this uh, is what is, is through a process called the national action plans that uh, that was mentioned by the previous speaker. So, um, and so we have in the region, South Asia region, four countries have adopted the national action plans. Uh, we have these in uh, Nepal, which was the first one to adopt it in Afghanistan, in Bangladesh and in Sri Lanka. So um, now just to discuss a bit about the successes and challenges of these national action plans. Uh, even before officially adopting uh, the national action plan, it was Sri Lanka resisted uh, adopting it for the longest time. But Sri Lanka has seen what, what uh, 
what um, advocates there and uh, observers there, women observers, have called an unofficial use of 1325 by civil society um, uh, while the state was resisting an official adoption of national um, uh, action plan. So the, the resolution served as a tool to identify a set of goals. Grassroots uh, Sri Lankan women um, who are completely unfamiliar of 1325 engaged in community work that promotes their role in public sphere, offering what is now known as an unintended bottom up localization of the 1325 resolution. Women's rights good groups independently advocated for and achieved legislation of 25% representation of women in local bodies. Uh, as a result of which, in 2018 elections, women's representation in local government rose to 2,000 women from a mere 82 women in, uh, in, in these offices in 2011. So that kind of advocacy by women's group has an, you know, an uh, uh, effect of implementation of the resolution goals of representation, particularly. The same is true, true about Nepal's uh, engagement uh, of, in, the, in the community. It is the first uh, national action plan in, in South Asia uh, and is recognized as the most participatory in terms of inclusion of various sectors of civil society, women as well, into the design and uh, uh, discussion of the national action plan. Uh, it achieved representation of 33% women in the constituency, uh, constituent assembly, and gender mainstreaming into policies and programs <clears throat> that are reflected in a number of uh, policies. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, Afghanistan has made substantial uh, uh, advancement with regard to women, peace, security. During the 20 year period of 2001 to 2021, and this has been largely due to activism of Afghan women, um, most of these gains were uh, quantitatively, uh, were, were quantitative, such as increased women's participation in, um, in political structures or, for example, in the education system. There were other um, uh, goals of these national action plans uh, on protection of, uh, on the protection aspect of it, focusing mainly on the prosecution of those responsible for gender-based violence and uh, resource-related uh, um, achievements that had limited success. The protection aspects also, although all the national uh, action programs included that with regard to prosecution for gender-based violence, there is no uh, documentation of any success on, on, on that front, that anybody has been held accountable for uh, the violations during the conflict. Now, what, what, what are the challenges? So this is understood as the limited success. The success has been mainly with regard to uh, the uh, quantitative with regard to uh, rise in representation of women in some process. And that is also uh, in some places limited and symbolic. So what are the challenges with regard to these um, you know, successful implementation of uh, this NAP? And it is here that one has to look at the inherent limitation of the UN, UN Security Council resolutions, um, uh, resolution as well, and therefore the national action plan that is consequently coming out of, of this. The, 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 what I mentioned earlier as to how it falls short of the feminist vision. So it is built in such a way that then, uh, then the results are necessarily limited. One challenge is how the WMP security agenda of the UN Security Council fails to address the structural causes of gender equality, as our first speaker mentioned. The, the institutional inequality and power relations that dominates the Security Council remains unchallenged and unexamined. These structural shortcomings of the resolution then consequently uh, causes the national action program, programs uh, to, uh, to fail, to generate any sustainable and structural transformation. Um, for example, the, the, without questioning the social realities of the context of Afghanistan was the national action program 
plan put in place. So what the plan has is that it ties women's protection to respect of family values. And it failed to address protection of women from Taliban's active ostracization of women from public life. So while the National Action Plan was uh, introduced, it was not like the Taliban had entirely di disappeared. There, there was still an ongoing uh, conflict that uh, was still waging, but the plan did not take that into account. So that is what, uh, you know, the, the inability um, of the um, resolution and the subsequent ones to address the structural issues. Then the understanding, when we're talking about women, peace, security issues of the UN Council, the term security is prioritized over peace repeatedly in that conceptualization. So what does that mean? It means that it upholds the fundamental premise of militarism. That remains against unchallenged. So the idea is, uh, 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 is that the only way to achieve peace is through, uh, is through prioritizing the security of the state uh, as opposed to security of its people, security of the women, security of the vulnerable and marginalized and targeted communities. It is always the prioritizing of security of the abstract state. And that is can be achieved, understand, mm -hmm. their understanding is only through heavy, military presence and possibly through uh, military action. So, the, so therefore the national action programs do not necessarily address issues of, uh, in, in, their, in the protection mandate, address issues of disarmament, of uh, demilitarization, of denuclearization in general, or for example, connect the uh, issue of proliferation of arms uh, or weapons with women's insecurity. So this notion of militarized and masculine notion of peace and security um, uh, does not view, for example, the re reduction of military expenditure as security peace. So for example, and, and as a result, South Asian states, uh, almost all states have a higher uh, percentage of their national budgets spent on uh, military expenditure rather than on issues that could potentially mitigate the root causes of conflict. Similarly, the understanding of, in the thing is also of security is also prioritization of security over rights uh, of, of the people within the conflict. So human rights and women's rights are often traded for ceasefire or peace, uh, overholding contract conflicting parties accountable for disrupting the peace and security to begin with. Again, this is a, you know, we have a lot of, um, I'm quoting a lot of examples of Afghanistan because it it's easily explains the conceptual points that I'm trying to put forward. So during the Kabul conference in 2020, uh, 2010, um, the women activists called on the Afghan leaders and the international community to protect their rights and not to trade it off for peace during, the ne during negotiation. But however, what happened in fact was the women leaders at the conference chose to endorse the reintegration of former Taliban fighters without clarifying how women's rights fit into this reintegration plan. And, and, and also the fact that uh, without uh, addressing the social context and social structural realities of, of a particular context, when you push ahead with peace, uh, um, peace talks, uh, it, it, it really is not sustainable because Afghan people knew that the progress towards gender equality made in those two decades was superficial. And, um, and uh, many of the conceptualization of gender roles, the inherent gender inequality and discrimination within the society uh, or the condemnation of that approach and the use of violence to enforce them was never really eradicated during those 20 years. So when Afghan uh, Taliban took over in 2021, women quickly deleted their photos from social media, deactivated their account, burned their educational uh, documents uh, the, because they were aware that the departure of international forces and arrival of Taliban means that women were left alone to suffer the new brutal reality. The, the period of time which they had was not used to address some of these structural issues. 
also that that most of these issues the challenges are there is a symbolic and symptomatic approach symptomatic in the sense you address the symptoms and not the root structural cause which i have already spoke about and symbolic are uh, despite the fact that there is a significant advancement and and i acknowledge and appreciate those advantages as being very important, um, uh, important, um, and in, in no way undermine them. Even those are um, in very many places, uh, very uh, in symbolic terms. Um, uh, uh, for example, only four women were included in a 21-member government negotiation team uh, in Afghanistan for the um, uh, Afghan talks. And finally, what the challenge is, is the, um, that these um, agenda, the women peace agenda uh, is geopolit global geopolitics driven. And what do I mean by that? Is that the acceptance of the commitments of 1325 and a consequent adoption of national action plan is often a precondition for international aid from donor, foreign donors. So the women peace agenda is often used as a political tool to garner global recognition and legitimacy by the conflict country without necessarily addressing the realities of, of its own society. Uh, it's also used as a bargaining chip in state building process, peace negotiations, and of course a justification for a military action. And we all know that that happened um, when the U.S. invaded Afghanistan, the, the reason provided was that it was there to protect uh, women's rights, that, that the Taliban would, is, uh, would uh, decimate if they, were, if they come to power. And yet, in the U.S.-Taliban negotiation between 2028 and 2020, no Afghan women were present. So these were you know, used as tools. And also, most of these foreign policies in played the uh, WPS agenda um, in the foreign policy than the domestic uh, policy. So um, those, um, having said that, then I, I would say that what would, um, let me just look, have a look over here. So, so to remove these barriers, um, or remove these barriers and challenges of, to national action program, uh, if one were to have a feminist foreign policies, it was essentially have to address the structural issues and the root causes of women's unequal economic, social, legal, cultural status in the status quo. It will have to be uh, uh, work on the elimination of patriarchal notions of gender role and the public-private dichotomy divide that it perpetuate, which would eventually, which would lead to removal of restrictions on women's visibility, mobility, it involves equal access to public spaces and resources, uh, <clears throat> building the technical capacities, as Ms. Santiago mentioned, with right to education of women, girls, and skills for adult um, working women, changes in family laws to remove discriminations against women, and equality in all uh, aspects of life, equal employment opportunities and trade activities. So the entire gamut of gender equality in, in various um, uh, social, economic, uh, political, and cultural life, that would what a feminist foreign policy in the region, if one were to dream, would entail. But this, this um, work, this thing of feminist is not necessarily um, a, the, the, it's not something that can be achieved, I believe, only through a feminist foreign policy, because this is what is happening and what has been achieved by decades of uh, uh, women's struggle in all our regions. Women's rights movements have been strong and uh, struggling for decades in Pakistan, in India, in Sri Lanka, in Bangladesh, in Nepal. Uh, a very vibrant women's rights movements have been raising all the issues that I've talked about for years. And any advancement we have seen may, is, is, is coming from out of these struggles. And it is whatever that we have achieved is then uh, could be taken up um, in, in within, uh, with, would form uh, part of the feminist foreign policies. Um, 
I'm not sure that this is something that uh, is um, will come from there. It, and therefore, as things stands right now, um, I do not see that there is a, a feminist foreign policy um, in South Asia, I believe is a distant dream. Basically for the uh, for reasons of the social political political realities of the countries of South Asia, which we are, which is a highly mil militarized, which is one of highly militarized native nation state, deeply uh, patriarchal societies of, of of all the countries here, cultural uh, hyper nationalist cultural and political hyper nationalism uh, existing in all our countries, the role of religion in politics. The intersectional experiences or in the region of various sections based on caste, ethnicity, religious, linguistic, sexual minorities, and all the unequal status uh, uh, and discrimination against these identities, and overall existence of weakened institutions. All of these factors have significantly weakened various institutions that promote um, you know, questioning of uh, working on, on, on structural issues. Uh, uh, you know, on, on having systems in place that will change these so, uh, existing socio-political realities. In conclusion, I will say that the achievement of goals of feminist foreign policy, policy will depend on seizing small political windows of opportunities to achieve incremental advances that will seem outward symbolic and symptomatic. I'm not saying that they are, I believe they are significant. All the advances that have been made so far by the women's movement, including the adoption of the milestone 1325 uh, resolution are a uh, landmark. And they are the ones that allow women in conflict uh, countries to stake a claim to be present at the table and therefore um, in incredibly important. Um, uh, but addressing the listed socio-political realities for a complete overhaul of system, which mean change of the structural uh, root causes will remain in the realm of people's movements, will remain in the realm of civil society mobilizations and struggle of women's women's movement from outside the system. It is there that the real changes happen, which then can yeah. result in in a in, in a policy of the system, which can then take uh, you know things forward. Um, I look forward to this discussion. Thank you very much. I'll end my talk. Is the PM Shanti Kumar still on? Now there are many, many questions by the participants. Dr. Vijaya Lakshmi Brara from Northeast, would you like to go first? Hello, are you there? Dr. Vijaya Lakshmi Brara. Bam Bamadev Sidgal, would you like to speak? Ms. Sashi Singh. I think you guys can unmute. Yeah, please introduce yourself. Yeah. Hello. I think Vijayalakshmi ji can speak. Vijayalakshmi ji. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Can you yes, hear me? We can yeah, hear you. We can hear you. Yes. Please also introduce yourself. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I have put my question in the question section. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm uh, I'm a sociologist uh, from Northeast. Uh, I've done a lot of research for 32 years in Northeast India. Uh, so, and also uh, I'm a cultural anthropologist plus, I've done a lot of work on the gender issues in uh, Northeast. And uh, yeah, so my first, first two questions are more in, uh, you know, to all the panelists, whoever want to answer. One is that, uh, yes, there is a, a lot of intervention. One can understand there's a lot of intervention happening in international levels. But the question which puts seal in many issues is seeing women as homogeneous category. Now, as Santiago touched by saying, what women? So, you know, uh, when we talk about feminism, when we talk about feminist movements, uh, you know, uh, we, we tend to homogenize women, which is not really a reality. So I want uh, somebody to uh, speak on that. And uh, second uh, is, uh, you know, if uh, Professor Vibhuti Patel can also answer, 
that uh, today itself we had this news that uh, in parliament they are now finally pushing the 33% reservation uh, so do you think that uh, this is a stir women approach uh, you know so i would like you to comment on that and uh, specifically for vahida uh, is that uh, uh, i would like to know that if foreign policy then uh, you know the way you have talked about the foreign policy does it largely depend on the domestic policies these are my questions thank you so so irene your first question about what women vipati is very hard for me to understand uh, uh what the question was so uh probably Someone no, I, I guess, uh, Santiago, I think if you can read in the question section, you will be able to. Yeah. In, no, the, what in, she the says that in your speech, you said, no, that uh, first of all, what is the representation, nature of representation, who are representing women when you talk about. So they said that whole uh, seeing women as a homogeneous category, does it solve the problem? That is her question. Yeah. So, okay. So as a homogeneous category, um, obviously I don't believe that <laughs> because I do I do think that you know there are different other uh, identities that are included uh, along with gender. You know, we have different identities. We have different levels of uh, you know. But so so even even thinking about what are our gender interests, sometimes you you also have. Uh, differences in on in on gender interests, and that's why, for many countries, it's very difficult to have a women's vote, right? Because we have we have different gender interests. So we, you know, all of those things, all those different identities. We are not one identity. There are several identities, and that's why the issue of power is very important, because. That's where you go, who is powerful and who is powerless according to the different other identities apart from gender. So I think that it's 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 very, very complicated. So to just to say um, more women in politics, what kind of women? You know? Mm. So 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 that's that's the reason, I mean, that's the reason why it it has it cannot be that simple. That is just because you're a woman, you know, there are other, as I said, there are other identities. Thank you. Ms. Ponya from Sri Lanka, would you like to speak? Because as you are going to leave, would you like to say something before you leave? You have also written your comments in the chat box. Mr. Pon uh, Ms. Ponya, hello. Logesvari, yeah. yeah. Would you like to speak? I think that's. Um, I think uh, she has left. She's left. She's there. She's there. She's very much there. She's just said that I'm leaving, but she's there. Hello. Okay. Oh. And I think the second question is about thirty-three okay. percent reservation. Whether it is an add and stir, I think I would say it is a long-standing long demand. Sixteen times the bill was introduced over last twenty-three years, right from nineteen uh, two thousand and. Uh, I think it was 1993, first time it was introduced, and we saw so many debates about only the the the, uh, the reservation, which some of political parties showed that it was the elite women who will benefit from reservation. And after that, the question of reservation within reservation was also being discussed. So it is uh, women's groups have been demanding because the muscle power, mafia power, and money power is such that women are not able to of contest election. We have seen the performance of women over last more than two decades in the Panchayati Raj institutions. And even UNDP and NIRD study shows that they were, so far as the practical gender needs were concerned, these women have performed really well. So uh, at the local cell government bodies, but none of the parties are giving them ticket. Even those who have given best years of their lives for their party, 30, 40 years of life, they have been bypassed when it comes to uh, election for legislative assembly and parliamentary elections. So I think after a massive uh, agitations, lobbying, 
uh, writing in the media and also mobilizing uh, so many women who have been very active in the social movements and the women's movement right from the early 70s. They have also joined this because it was only initially that the women who were in the freedom movement who said that by reservation, we achieved everything in a extremely patriarchal setup and we fought against the colonial rule. But they also realized, uh, uh, the, the stalwarts also realized that things had changed. Participation of women in the uh, uh, upper echelons of power had reduced and it is in this context that the demand emerged. We have seen the response of the European Union also where there is a 40% reservation of there for women, for women parliamentarians of Europe and the agenda has changed. The whole subculture within the European Parliament has also changed. So many real issues of the country have been taken up. All the old boys who were taking nation states decision in the pub after the parliamentary hours, that, has, that culture has gone. The issues are debated within the parliament. There are limitations definitely as I didn't say that uh, the macro, the issues of world order and macroeconomic policies, which are which need to be raised, some of the small countries are doing that, and we saw that during even the pandemic, these women leaders put people before profit. No, so I think that the culture, political culture, will differ if there are thirty three percent women in the. Uh, upper echelons of power structure. We see what's happening in Bangladesh or Nepal or uh, Pakistan also. All of them have a reservation and women are getting some voice and representation. And I think if uh, all the South countries unanimously raise their voice, I think things will change. I feel optimistic. Yeah, thank you. Now there is there are several questions. I think one is Shashi Singh. Would you like to go ahead? Okay. No, I had a question for Vahida about uh, this Vahida, relation yeah, yeah, between yeah, yeah. domestic and the foreign policy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I Hello, Vibhuti. Uh, I'm Shashi. Can I go ahead? Uh, Vahida will answer, then you can go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Vahida okay. has to answer the question. So, the question was whether foreign policy largely depend on domestic policy. Um, I would say that there, if, if it doesn't, foreign policy has to resonate with the domestic policy and, and vice versa. If it isn't, then you are having a different stand for, uh, for a domestic policy on the same issues and other for uh, another standard for uh, the others. Like it is, as they say, in some foreign policies, they take one position in their foreign policy and they do not necessarily, you know, abide by the same with regard to do domestic policies. Um, so um, that is definitely there and it does depend on, because foreign policy is an articulation of one's own domestic policy in the international regional sphere, in a different sphere. So it is dependent in a way in, on, on domestic policy. And uh, and, that, and that's where, you know, that this domestic foreign policy that would inform a foreign policy. So just tying this up to the 33% question, uh, it may be a representative, it may be, you know, in quantities, in numbers, but the more you have women, there is a higher likelihood of uh, women taking on issues of um, uh, of feminist foreign policy. That is what, you know, would, would potentially color the existing foreign policy towards, move it towards a feminist policy foreign policy, whereas when you do not have that level of, of critical mass in higher uh, places of power, then you do not have that possibility of including those issues uh, within the foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you, thank now, you very much. Uh, yeah. Hello, good evening, uh, everybody. I'm Shashi Singh uh, from the Consortium of Women Entrepreneurs of India. And um, yesterday also, I had uh, raised this issue on, um, uh, it was more on the economic empowerment issue. But here I would uh, continue with what you have just said on the um, Women's Reservation Bill, which has just been tabled today in the parliament. And we have yet to see, it's been a long journey for India as well. And um, the Panchayati Raj, yes, has done well and 50% have been, uh, you know, we see 50% of participation. Initially in the in this th uh, third tier uh, system of the, of the grassroots women coming in, um, initially they were just supposed to be the 
um, uh, rubber stamp of the men who were in uh, power and they had their wives to be elected. But um, it's not that anymore. And uh, full participation of uh, women is taking happening. But I um, had this point of, um, you know, right now in the, as you said, in the legislation and the, at the, uh, the central level, if at the national level, the women who've been elected how many of them really talk about, you know, the women who need to be um, addressed? You know, usually they 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 uh, they again rubber stamp what the um, uh, the party says. So it's not uh, it's not about um, uh, a woman being elected and who's um, uh, sort of apolitical or uh, is not sensitive to issues which you know, maybe wrong in the party, but you have to rise above politics in this in this case. So we talk about, like earlier it was said, the right kind of, mm, the good quality of women coming into uh, uh, the political system because they would be good decision makers and they will really, um, uh, uh, you know, power the rule, power the whole essence of a policy making and decision making process in the government, good governance, etc. So how do we do that? So can we talk about how uh, women are being trained to uh, take up these issues and come up in the uh, legislation and uh, at the national level uh, in the political system? That was one of my questions that how, you know, we don't see good quality women coming up because as you you yourself said, muscle power and manpower and money, et cetera, is, uh, is the real issue. Uh, in poly. Number two, uh, two, I was wanting to go back to the four R's. You know, that was because I'm into the economic issue. So I I think the, um, the four R's which was talked about, the rights, you know, rights, uh, representation, resources, reality, etc. All, all these are political issues. But I wanted to bring in trade, diplomacy, um, you know, defense, development. I mean, here even a apolitical uh, person as an activist can also take up um, these issues as a group. So you are talking about uh, outside the parliamentary um, thing, like as a civil society or as a powerful lobbying uh, body, you know, a think tank which uh, talks about these issues. So how do we empower that kind of a group? I think it's important to bring that element, uh, which is apolitical and above the politic uh, thing. And uh, what I had asked this question was that poverty, we have to address that as, you know, savings are declining and as we see in the household. So poverty is really bringing in the distress amongst women. And so uh, how do we look at peace and prosperity when women are so depressed and distressed and are fighting for two meals a day or looking up, uh, for the next bread and butter for the children? So um, this is a very um, uh, dichotomy if we look at that. One, we are looking at our peace and prosperity, but uh, do we look at hunger and poverty? How do we elevate that? So that was my question to the panelists. Uh, if you can answer them. Thank you so much. Dr. Atika, would you like to answer? Ma'am, can we yes. take yeah. questions? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think... Okay, thank you. I think uh, I would like to respond on the questions about the... Uh, you know, seeing women as a homogeneous category because I think uh, it is important to, I mean, to uh, raise this issue. Uh, we should acknowledge that uh, actually women peace and security agenda has been criticized for essentializing women's experiences in conflict and, and for not recognizing the diversity of women's experiences. Therefore, I think there is a need to, you know, to incorporate intersectionality into women peace and security resolution and national action plan uh, you know because uh, they have you know their women's experiences of conflict and insecurities are shaped by uh, various factors such as race ethnicity class sexuality uh, and their ability so i think we need to add uh, i mean this kind of approach intersectionality approach uh, to recognize the interconnect Uh, of different social identities and experiences. That's why I think women have, you know, have a unique experiences of discrimination and uh, oppression. I think that's just one of my, uh, I mean, uh, respond to the patient. Thank you, Prof Patel. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you, ma'am. She also raised a question of poverty that uh, without addressing the question of poverty and deprivation, can we have a just peace in the society? There are, yeah, Irene. <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, you you asked me. I was I was getting ready to answer your <laughs> your very first question, which was you know my experiences as a negotiator. Because I think uh, it's this can this this type of uh, experience is can really go uh, is replicable in other areas. So first is it always um, how do you become a negotiator? How do you get in? Usually you're not invited, right? So the whole issue of representation participation is a really big one. So I'll just tell you what my experience was because people always ask me, how did you become a negotiator? And you know what, you know what I did? The, the, the chairman of the panel uh, asked me if I could help him. So I, and then I said, no, I am not sitting behind you anymore. You know, he wanted me to help him. I'm not sitting behind you anymore. You want me, you make me sit beside you. I said, I, I am, I will have to be a member of your panel so that, you know, I, I, I will be there to help, but I'm not sitting behind you anymore. You know, so I had this thought, thought bubble. I'm smarter than you are. And you're, <laughs> you're going to take credit for me for my thought. So I, in, in other words, I'm saying you want it, you ask for it, you know? And, and you say, I'm not sitting behind you, I'm sitting beside you. So that's the first one. How do you get in? The second one is when you get there, you're already there, you don't really have the knowledge um, because they're talking about security issues and very few women know about security issues. So you really have to be a quick study and don't put your issues first. You know, if I had been known only as a gender expert, I would have been totally marginalized. So I said, so what's on the table? The table was about uh, ceasefire, okay? So what do I know about ceasefire? <laughs> so I studied, I, you know, I did that, everything. And then I became an expert. When I became an expert on ceasefires, then people, then they, the, they started to listen to me because I was, I was not talking about my issue. I was talking about issues that were, that were on the table. And, and so, so women have to learn to do things like that. So, you know, what's on the table? You become an expert on that. And then you introduce gender is what I'm saying. So, so that was a, a good. The other thing that helped me as a negotiator was that I had good drafting skills. So when you're, dra when you're drafting a negotiate, uh, negotiated agreement, you need to draft. So there was one time I really saved the whole uh, peace negotiations because I got the right uh, words mm -hmm. together. <laughs> so, you know, so those are things that are important. And, so, and then the last thing I want to say is about, okay, so how do you become influential? You're there. Yeah, but you know, they, can, they can take your word for it or not. So what I did was I had a constituency behind me. So I, I played this inside outside strategy. I was inside, but they knew I had a constituency outside who were pushing for a certain way and, and they knew how to use uh, public opinion. So on the third part, which is how do you now become influential within the panel, within the panel, first, you have to have organizing skills because you have to form coalitions. Number two, you have to have good communication skills because <laughs> you have to, yeah, you know, all those things. So I'm just saying all of this to, 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 tell, to tell the participants, uh, the people who are listening now, that, that there are things you have to be innovative about. But you're always you're always conscious of the fact that no, I'm not going to be sidelined. No, I'm not going to be marginalized. But this is what it is. 
and I'm going to learn and I'm going to become skillful. Okay, so so enough about about me and negotiation. Thank you. Now I would like uh, Dr. Vaida Naina to tell us about the functioning of International Criminal Court and your in what way the learnings from whatever negotiations that took place at the time of civil war or ethnic cleansing or the, uh, uh, the, the International Criminal Court's work in Kampuchea or so Somalia or Bosnia or many important uh, human tragedies that the planet witnessed during the 20th and 21st century. Um, uh, thank you, Vibhuti. I can. I will talk about my expense experiences of uh, advocacy, doing advocacy in the international criminal court process uh, before it was uh, accepted and adopted by the minimum number of countries. There were these two, twenty, two or three, uh, three years of intense. Uh, 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 negotiations with uh, the member states of the United Nations to incorporate for gender integration into the key documents of the International Criminal Court, which is the Rome Statute and its supporting documents, that is the definition of uh, gender crimes as well as the rules and procedures of uh, of uh, the um, the court, um, but this was happening at the time when there was already uh, the world had seen um, the civil war in the former Yugoslavia and the and the genocide in Rwanda, and um, and uh, accountability was a big discussion during those days. Accountability for these international crimes. There wasn't a a, a, a language or a law there uh, that to deal with that. So the Security Council, uh, which is a body, only body within the UN to deal with issues of international peace and security, then had to hurriedly put together the uh, the international criminal tribunal of the former yugoslavia and then of course the uh, that that of uh, rwanda so these tribunals were already functioning okay now um it, it was first was for for Yugoslavia that was established, and then there was a lot of criticism about the international community doing nothing when the Rwanda genocide was happening, and then that was the kind of criticism of uh, the so-called Western world dominated United Nations to uh, then push them to also form a criminal tribunal in 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 Rwanda, and these two tribunal gave a huge. Uh, um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, a huge was a huge impetus to then form then the need. The idea was: Are we going to form a new criminal tribunal each time that there's going to be a massive, you know, international you know, crisis? And the answer was: No, that cannot. You need a permanent criminal court that would deal with similar situation as and when they arise, and that would empower the court to go in and address from an accountability perspective. And that was what the process was about. And then the need and, and women's international women's movement has just, had just come out of the Beijing uh, um, uh, experience, Beijing conference experience in 1995. And it was immediately within two years that the negotiations for the Rome statute had already begun and women were not there in place. Just before the Rome conference, a year before the women's community, particularly those who were active in the um, Vienna human rights movement uh, in, in 1994 that put together a women's caucus and started advocating for inclusion of gender crimes in the statute of the International Criminal Court. And for experience, you already have the experiences of women survivors of the Yugoslav um, Yugoslav civil war, as well as the experiences of women during the genocide in Rwanda, to both then form the basis of uh, what uh, gender crimes you are, are uh, you know, advocating for inclusion and, and why. And the, the way this was formed was that women from around the world came together every time there was a discussion on the statute with experiences of dealing with gender crimes in their own countries. They came and put together and said, 
this is what we experience in, in our country. We do not want the same to repeat in the international setup. So that was the basis of advocacy. Even when the final at the room conference, when advocacy was happening, as Irene mentioned, one of the important skills you need is drafting, is, is drafting the right language. You, can, you cannot believe you had all kinds, even within the Women's Caucus, there was a lot of disagreement with in terms of what gender crimes you want to include. How do you define those? Because women coming from around the world had different experiences of those. And how do you include all these concerns in the language that you are proposing to the member states to include within the statute? So that was the kind of experience that, that one had um, you know, uh, in doing that. And, and the whole advocacy purposes, you can clearly see the geopolitics that is that is happening over there, what, which countries have the power to influence and to push your language in in the in the in the setting and get what is there. So you are advocating all the states, big and small, but there clearly are some countries with a lot more power to you know get uh, things on board. So that was another experience, um, and you also had experience of consistently facing. Um, barriers from key some of the key countries were which were um, which which then had found what what is popularly called the unholy alliance between you know some Muslim states within the Gulf and others and Catholic states in Latin America as long as the Vatican would consistently put roadblocks with regard to integration of even the term gender in the document and. As a result of the negotiations and the compromise, you had to they had to put uh, uh, an explanation to the word gender in, in the statute, which said, explained that when, whenever the term gender is used in the statute, it only and only means gender means men and women in the context of society. So that was how it it, it was addressed. Uh, we would, of course, not have liked that particular caveat in there, but these are the kind of uh, compromises that one makes. And of course, we were not making it. It was the member states making it and, um, and, and so on. So those were the experiences that you had in the, in the nego negotiation process and, and, and the barriers you face as uh, people trying to get certain issues on 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 the on main documents and subsequently of course now the court has been accepted and been functioning for almost 20 years of course it is not uh, it is not in any way um, what women's caucus for gender justice who advocated for those crimes to be in included imagine it completely functioning but it nevertheless has attained uh, several uh, it has attained uh, uh, accountability for gender crimes in in certain countries where uh, there was a highest rate, particularly the highest rate of sexual violence uh, that the court had uh, uh, again. Now, again, a geopolitics of that subsequent to these in, um, these uh, uh, ad hoc tribunals that were placed, then there was also a question about what about the situations that happened you know, many years ago? Do we need uh, a tribunal for that? What kind of tribunal? Because those cannot be addressed within the International Criminal Court. So that's how then there were what is called um, hybrid tribunals that were formed in Cambodia, as well as in Sierra Leone, which hybrid in the sense it was a Cambodian international regional body that looked into the crimes that happened uh, during the Pol Pot regime. And, and the persecution of political uh, opponents there. And, uh, and these were mainly driven by people's uh, um, survivors community, survivors organization that insisted for some sort of international acknowledgement of what their uh, families or their forefathers had uh, been through. And therefore the processes of that, and I was of course invited to be a uh, part of um, uh, a jury member of a, a nine member mm. inter panel listening to survivors of the Pol Pot regime and, and applying the kind of laws that existed then to talk about also the need for a formal uh, uh, accountability mechanisms for that um, thing. So those were kind of uh, broadly my experiences that I thought would be useful to share here. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, can we have the next question from Miss Anita Ji? And can you introduce yourself, where you're from, and your location? Anita Ji, are you there? Anita Banerjee Ji, you can unmute. Okay, Tanuja ji has also raised a question. Okay, Anita ji has not asked question. She's from Tashkent in, uh, yeah, from Uzbekistan. She has raised hand. Okay, okay, yeah. Anita ji, please go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Oh, she's not responding. Okay, okay. Tanuja ji has also asked a question. Okay. Uh, and raised hand, but the question is not here. Meanwhile, if we are missing any questions, Sasha, can you read them out from Q&A box? Correct. Must have been addressed. There are 10, but all are addressed. Okay. Shashi okay. Singh, Vijaya Bharata, Ramdev Singh, uh, Bama Dev from Sri Lanka, she has left. Pranav Acharji. Pranav Acharji. Yeah. Okay. His question is there. Would you like to speak, Mr. Pranav? Harsha, you can read it out in the interest of time. Yes. What should, be, what should be the proper step for international feminist category to present women as individual, not as women, as they can equally deal every sphere of security and peace in the world system? I think Irene Ma'am covered it and all the panelists covered it before. So, yes, Mr. yeah, Patel, <clears throat> we can go for a way forward uh, one, two minutes remark from everyone. But before, yeah, yeah, please. would you yeah. like to make your comments as well? Yeah, first, okay. I think the panelists, yeah, way forward. What okay. are your tips? Yes. Okay. So, we can start with reverse manner, Vaidama? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. Way forward remarks. Oh, the way forward remarks. Yeah, um, I I believe that I I think I addressed that in my in my presentation. But I would like to reiterate that the way forward would be to continue um, continue with the you know these questions, raising these questions, and uh, bringing to light some of the deficiencies of the women, peace, and agenda security agenda uh, of the uh, of the you know, UN Security 1325, um, but at the same, and at the same time, uh, you know, advocate for, um, for its implementation in ways that addresses, because I believe although the 1325 does not address structural uh, issues, it, there is no reason that the National Action Plan does not you know, include their own social realities within their uh, within the national action plan to uh, you know and and address some of the structural questions, make the intersectional connections for the causes of conflict, and try to have programs to address those issues, and um, and and take it forward. So, and in terms of feminist for foreign policies, as I mentioned, it it is the p the it is it is a state. Um, foreign policy is a state uh, document and a, a feminist foreign policy will also be a state document that can be achieved i believe only when the, the balance has tilted when when there is subst substantial uh, critical mass in, in 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 the state mechanisms that is has uh, uh, pr proclivity towards a feminist vision of society of to, I, I would say a more gender equal a more gender uh, nuanced vision of society and once that has happened then uh, a feminist foreign policy would, I believe would follow but that would come about as uh, from women's movements and from people's movements and civil society movements, just as we have the example, 16 years or more of of advocating for uh, you know representation is just being tabled right now. So similarly, when you have more critical mass um, advocating for uh, for a feminist foreign policy, I believe that will happen, and um, and and when that happens, it, it it will be a policy that will address structural issues or. Um, uh, that would leave 
to gender equality. Thank you. Dr. Alam, you can go next. Okay, I think, uh, thank you for the last, uh, I mean, uh, conclusion to move forward. I think uh, through uh, feminist foreign policy, I think uh, now is the moment uh, actually for Southeast uh, or South, Southeast and South Asian countries to develop a gender foreign policy that is unique and applicable uh, to ASEAN countries with the, its complexity, as well as to start a conversation about gender mainstreaming beliefs. And then I think what needs to uh, investigate is how actually the existing gender responsive approach to security, democracy, and diplomacy could benefit security itself, uh, democracy, and democratization in many countries. I think uh, that's my uh, final remarks. Thank you. Now, yeah. Now Eddie. we go. Yeah. Jim. Irene, your final remarks are way ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of one of the things I believe in um, very strongly is that what got into history can get out of history, and um, and so there's a there's a moment here where we can get a lot of history. I mean, because we've learned a few lessons along the way, and we're smart. Okay. Um, but as I always say, when you when you want, you have to you you denounce a lot of things. You, you don't like oppression. You don't like this. You don't like patriarchy. But so, but what are you announcing? You know, this is what I'm always saying. What are you announcing? Because uh, that is the one that is what I call the seductive dream. <laughs> I this is the one that will seduce uh, us to work for this better world. Um, so I would like us also at the same time that we're denouncing all of these practices, that we're announcing something that, that will seduce people to work for a better world. And, 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 and I cannot emphasize enough the word connection, because that's what we need to do, much division in the world. So I think the announcing that the women and, and, and the men, how do we connect rather than how do we divide, right? So I, I'm a communicator. And so I don't like to say, uh, let's, uh, instead of dividing, let us, you know, all that, because what they say, when you negate the frame, you evoke the frame, right? So let's just announce what it is that will, that is our seductive dream. And I think that's one way that we should go from now on. Thanks. Yeah. Nice to have all of you. <laughs> nice to be with all of you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. I like oh. it, seductive dream. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Closing remarks. Yes. Can we have your closing remarks? Yeah. I think, thank you, Dr. Irene Santiago, Dr. Atika Alami, and Dr. Vaidha Naina. You have made a very extremely engaging and evocative presentations. Uh, today, we have learned that justice and holistic development of all communities are the drivers of long lasting peace. There cannot be peace without social justice, economic justice, environmental justice, and gender justice. It is important to recognize peace from a gendered lens by ending immunity for any act of violence against women, installing a gender equal decision making process amidst peacemaking efforts that are sustainable in, uh, and it's very necessary. Uh, feminist foreign policy calls upon the state to promote and practice gender equality, ensuring all women enjoy their human rights, even though even even through diplomatic relations. Feminist foreign policy aims to incorporate policies and initiatives to not just control war or diplomacy or security, but also to manage and promote visibility of women and other marginalized groups in the decision-making process. And it ensures that women are treated as equal. They uh, enjoy their human rights within the international commitments too. And uh, the, the R's, the, the, the two more R's, which, which can be incorporated in the existing foreign policy. This is the rights representation resources, uh, research and reporting, monitoring and evaluation, 
and the reach, reaching out to people, I think it's very important. And that's why human security challenges the, uh, the to the power structures and intersectionality. I think these are the important mantras that we, uh, we uh, that, that have been the takeaway of today's discussion. Thank you very much. Over to Imriti. Thank you, ma'am. Can we go for the word of thanks now? Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. As we come to the end of feminist foreign policy in the Asia-Pacific region, an online international workshop program, a two-day immersive online discussion workshop, I, Harsha Patra, researcher at MP, Impact and Policy Research Institute, would like to propose the formal vote of thanks on behalf of MP New Delhi. We are grateful to our experts, Ms. Farida Akhtar, Ms. Lavanya Shanbhog Arvind, Ms. Preeti Daruka, Ms. Iriana Santiago, Dr. Wahida Nenor, and Dr. Atkanur Al Alami for taking out their valuable time and giving us an opportunity to learn from this program. We thank our chair, Professor Vibhuti Patel, for her insights. We thank all of our participants who have raised questions and actively participated in today's deliberation. We hope you found this program helpful and insightful, and it helped in broadening horizons. We are grateful if you're watching us later on YouTube. Hello. The program will be, uh, it's a, a screen and it is telecast and see, uh, and uh, streamed on YouTube, Spotify, uh, LinkedIn, uh, uh, Twitter, Facebook Live, uh, and podcast. So, and it is used extensively by the students and researchers and journalists and diplomats and social activists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Adi. Thank you. 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 Thank you.